Hey guys, what's up? My name is Beatbreaker and in today's part 3 of my how to build a home server tutorial series, we're gonna look at how to set up your own home server using Linux. So today's video is gonna be really packed. First of all, I'm gonna show you how to set up a USB drive with Linux on it. Then we're gonna look at the BIOS settings for the home server in order to make it run as silent as possible. Then I'm gonna walk you through the Linux installation on the home server and show you how to connect to your Linux server from Windows. Then we're going to discuss how to partition, format and mount large hard drives in the Linux file system. We're going to look at the power draw of my home server and finally at the noise that it produces. You can find links to each individual topic in the description box below, but without any further ado, let's hop right into the video. Now for this home server, I decided to go with the Ubuntu server distribution as I think it is very easy to use even for beginners. So head over to ubuntu.com and download the 1804 long-term support ISO. Next, head over to Rufus IE and download the Rufus software. Now this allows you to burn the ISO on a USB stick. Once downloaded, open up Rufus and select an at least 4GB sized USB stick as device. Boot selection, select disk or ISO and select the Ubuntu 18.04 ISO. The rest you don't really need to touch. You can give it a volume label name if you want to, but other than that, just click on start. Now when this pops up, you can select OK. And here you also want to select OK. Make sure that you don't have any important data on your drive, because otherwise it will get deleted. You can now plug your USB drive into your home server and open up the BIOS. In my case, I have to press delete. Now, first of all, we're gonna check if all of our components are correctly recognized. As you can see, it recognizes 32 gigs of DDR3-1600 memory. We don't want to do anything in the OC tweaker, but straight head for the advanced tab. Here under North Bridge configuration, we want to make sure that the primary graphics adapter is enabled. Now in most cases, having a graphics card for a home server doesn't make an awful lot of sense, so you definitely want to stick to the onboard graphics. Under Hardware Monitor, I have set up fan curves for the CPU fan, so I selected the Automatic Fan Mode, set the target CPU temperature to 45 degrees, as well as set the target fan speed to level 2. Now obviously this depends on your cooling solution and your case, so you might need to change this to a different level. The chassis case I set to level 1, as I want it to be as silent as possible. Now, as you can see, in my case, the CPU fan is sitting at around 750 RPM, while the chassis fan is around 500 RPM. This results in temperatures between 30 and 35 degrees in my case. And finally, in the boot section, I enabled the boot from LAN option, in case I wanted to wake up my home server from LAN. Hit exit, save changes and exit, and click OK. Now we want to make sure to boot from the flash drive, so in my case I'm gonna hit F11 and select the USB drive to boot from. This will then load up the Ubuntu server installation, where you can now choose the language. Obviously in my case I'm gonna select English, as well as your keyboard layout. Next we want to install Ubuntu, don't select anything here. And in the network connections tab, we can also just select the standard connector. We don't want to set the system up as a proxy, so just click on done. Next we get the option to specify where we want to get our packages from, but we simply want to get them from the standard Ubuntu archive. Now in the file system setup, I select use an entire disk, as I want to have this Linux installation on my SSD. Now you might want to select manual here depending on your setup. Now in retro perspective, it would have probably been smart to already set up my other devices here as well. I do not want to set up RAID nor LVM, but I could have probably just set up the Linux file system here for my other drives, which I'm actually going to be doing in just a minute, so I'm just going to have the Samsung SSD as my primary drive. Hit done and confirm the destructive action. Now in this screen we can select a name for ourselves as well as our server. I'm going to go for admin and Kirill, which is an exotropical cyclone, so why not? Uh, picking a username, I tried to go for admin until I realized that that's actually not possible. So you're gonna actually have to pick an actual username. I decided to go back and use Roman as my username and then also fittingly Roman as my name. Choose a secure password and hit done. 
Now you definitely want to make sure to install the OpenSSH server as this allows you to remotely access your Linux server. I don't want to import any SSH identities and hit done. Now on this screen, you can already install a few predefined server environments. And in my case, I want to use this home server as a Nextcloud instance. So I'm going to go ahead and select Nextcloud. I'm also going to be using some tools that rely on Docker. So I'm also going to mark Docker. And finally, I'm also going to enable the stress ng in order to make sure that my home server is actually stable. Click on done, which will then complete the installation. After rebooting, you are now able to log in to your home server via your username, so in my case that was Roman, and your password. Now from this login screen, you should definitely write down the IPv4 address in order to remotely connect to your Linux server. The first thing you probably want to do once you've installed Ubuntu is to upgrade your packages. So type sudo apt-get update followed by sudo apt-get dist upgrade. Now the first command there is going to upgrade the list of installed packages that you have in your Ubuntu installation and then the second command is actually going to upgrade them or update them. Now the second command is also going to remove obsolete packages. So in case you don't want it to automatically uninstall packages that you're not requiring no longer, you might only want to enter sudo apt-get upgrade. Now, since this is the server version of the Ubuntu distribution, it doesn't come with any GUIs, so there's no graphical user interface, there's only the command line. Now, you could install a regular desktop on your Linux machine, but I would highly recommend not to do so because of the high performance draw that such a desktop environment comes with. However, what I do recommend is getting a software to access your home server from your Windows machines. And the software that I usually like to use is Mobile Xterm. This is an SSH client that also allows you to see all of your files in a regular file system. So go to this link in the description below, download Mobile Xterm, it's completely free. And this video is not sponsored by either Ubuntu nor Mobile Xterm, by the way. So go to the free client and download the installer edition. Install Mobile Xterm and in the left pane, right click on the user sessions, click on new session, go to SSH and enter the IP address that you've seen after the installation of Ubuntu. In my case, this is 192.168.178.31. Username, you select the name that you've given yourself. So in my case, that's Roman and enter your password. And that's it, you're successfully connected to your home server. Now, as I said, on the left-hand side, you can see kind of a tree overview of your entire server and you can also edit all of the files. Now, in order to set up a standard editor, what you want to do is go to settings, go to configuration, under default text editor program, click on the search icon and select your favorite editor. In my case, I'm going to be using Notepad++. So once you've done that, you can right click on any file and open it up with your favorite text editor. After you've made some changes, you want to hit Ctrl S, which will then bring up this prompt that allows you to subsequently save all of the changes on the remote. Next, you want to give a password to the root user. So type in sudo passwd root, enter your password for your user and enter a new Unix password. In order to partition our drives, we want to be logged in as the root user. So type su root and enter the password that you've just set. Now, when you type the fdisk-l command, you can see all of the disks that are currently set up in your Linux installation. The first five disks are for the operating system, as well as the 500 gigabyte SSD, which is our boot disk. Now, as you can see, the disks that I've put into my Linux server already had some Microsoft partitions on them. So we're gonna have to remove them in the next step. In order to do so, type fdisk as well as the disk. So in my case, slash dev slash sda, type M for help, type D to delete a partition. Now we wanna select the partition number, so one, type D again, enter, and make sure to actually write the changes to disk using W. Now, if you type fdisk-l once again, you can see that the SDA disk is ready to be partitioned. And I'm gonna do the same for the last disk listed. Now, when you type lsblk, you can see that none of the disks actually have partitions on them other than the 500 gigabyte SSD that we've set up during the Ubuntu installation. Now, because these hard drives are larger than two terabytes, we're gonna have to set up GPT partition tables on them. To do so, type in parted slash def slash sda. So this is the identifier of the first hard drive 
MK label GPT. And if you're okay with destroying any data on the disk, type in Y. Next, we're gonna type parted A OPT, then again our disk identifier, MK part primary XT4 from 0% to 100%. Now, what this makes is it creates a primary XT4 partition on our SDA drive. We're gonna repeat this process for our other drives. And when we type lsblka, we can see that we've successfully created partitions for all of our hard drives. Now, before we can actually use these partitions, we also have to set up the Linux file system on them. In order to do so, type in mkfs.xt4, so that's the xt4 file system. If you want to, you can give it some label by typing dash l and then a name, and then type in the disk identifier. Now, importantly, you want to enter SDA1, so the first partition on the SDA disk, don't type in SDA as this would not work. Once we have repeated the same process for our other drives, we're going to create three folders in the mount directory. So those are going to be the folders where the data is actually going to be stored at. In my case, I'm going to create a cloud1, 2 and 3 folder in the mount directory. Now, in order to actually mount the hard drives onto these locations, we're going to have to edit the slash etc slash fstab file. I'm going to be using vim. So if you open it up, press E on your keyboard and you're able to type in stuff. I've already prepared some stuff. So I'm going to have the disk identifier. So the slash dev slash sda one. Make sure to actually put in the partition and not the entire disk here, because otherwise it doesn't work once again, as well as the mount point. So this is going to be mount cloud3, cloud2, as well as cloud1. Then we have the xt4 file system, uh, which is just a file system. We have defaults, as well as a 0 and 2. Now the 2 indicates that we want to check the file system at every boot. Hit escape and type in colon wq. And once you type mount a, the drives are going to be mounted at the respective mount locations. You can check this by typing df-h. Next, we want to make sure that the server is always going to have the same local IP address. So go into your router configuration. Usually that's the 192.168.1.1. In my case, I'm going to have a Fritz box, but this might obviously vary depending on the router that you have. Go to your home network, click on your home network overview, or just kind of try to access the page where you can see all of the connected devices. Click on details on your home server and make sure that always assign the same network device IP is ticked. I also like to enable wake on LAN and hit OK. And with that, we've pretty much already set up our home server. Now let's have a look at the power that this thing draws from the wall. So as you can see from our measurements, we are peaking at around 100 watts after turning it on, which then goes down to around 50 watts while idling to maybe 60 watts while being accessed. Now, when I take these 50 watts and multiply them by 24 hours and 365 days, I get around 440 kilowatt hours, which translates here in Switzerland to around $60 energy costs per year. And finally, when looking at the noise of my home server, I can definitely say that my main computer is much louder. So whenever I'm here and actually working on my computer, the home server is pretty much inaudible. And with this, we have reached the end of today's video. I hope you guys learned something new here. And if you are also setting up your own home server, then definitely tell me in the comment section below how it goes. If you like this video, leave a like. If you want to see more like this, subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you guys in the next video.